the the Chinese and Russian examples I think are are helpful for the the prescriptive like what are we taking away from what we have learned about the process right so what can we do better and Clive just answered that from his perspective world leadership wasn't what it ought to have been um, or could have been or should have been in in the context of the development of vaccines so what would you all say if I were to ask you you know what what's the takeaway here in a prescriptive way for what we might have Done, done better and need to do better next time. And, and the Chinese and Russian cases can be examples from which to, to build. Maybe I'll start with Nicole. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some, some criticisms, I guess, particular to the Chinese and Russian vaccines. So global health officials are, are express skepticism and mistrust of vaccines that are approved quickly um, or distributed quickly. So it's important to engage in, you know, in the full clinical trial testing process to ensure safety and efficacy of vaccines. Um, we've expedited that, but you know, as you saw in the AstraZeneca trial and uh, in some other previous vaccine trials, like with dengue vaccines, there have been adverse uh, reactions in late stages, and so we do need to have that kind of testing and, and so forth in place. But just to return to the you know the point I was trying to make earlier, I think that this is an opportune moment for us to really think: How do we want to reward research and development? Uh, globally, what are the you know the 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 good things to get companies and and entrepreneurs and so forth interested in in pursuing, and how can we ensure that you know we get early access to other vaccines for pressing health problems that are you know HIV, TB, so forth that are still plaguing the world's populations, as well as you know those that threaten and will probably you know continue to threaten us in, in future pandemics. And we, we want to make sure that everyone has a um, the, the development of medicines that they need to address the, the worst health problems globally. Great, R Ruth next and then, and then Reed and we're gonna then go to our next topic. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm gonna speak specifically right now because you asked about the Russian and Chinese vaccines and kind of go back to the global ethics challenges with respect to equitable access not just for vaccines, but as Nicole rightly keeps reminding us for much more that is needed to keep people um, at a point where they can have a decent human life in terms of their health. So we have two countries that have invested heavily in the development of vaccines. Uh, the Russian vaccine, uh, a company called Gamalea, um, the vaccine I think now is called Sputnik V. And I have to say that every time I say that, I feel like I wanna say the Soviet Union is developing this vaccine, but okay, it's the Russian vaccine. Uh, it, um, it is a vaccine, the data about which uh, has not been much reviewed outside of uh, the Soviet, <laughs> there you go, the Russian uh, sort of scientific network. Uh, that said, the uh, Russian government is actively shopping their vaccine to a range of middle income countries right now, uh, some of whom may already signed uh, bilateral, bilateral agreements, we think, but they're not yet publicly known, at least uh, as far as some of us who are watching this space can tell. Uh, the Russian have approached the WHO uh, for potential review of their vaccine data. We'll wait and see what happens. But the point is when we try to estimate something like uh, the size of the numbers of people for whom courses of vaccine will be available until we know exactly um, how many doses the Russians are saying they can produce for the rest of the world as well as for their own country. And something about how uh, good their vaccine is, that's going to be a big unknown. The Chinese have multiple vaccines uh, uh, in development. Actually, uh, both the Russian and the Chinese vaccines are deployed widely in both of their countries. The um, Chinese vaccines, one of which is developed in conjunction with a Chinese Canadian company, and it's that particular vaccine has seen the most public scrutiny because it's a Canadian uh, China joint venture. Uh, they are working out and making major commitments with countries around the world. And this is clearly, I'm thinking especially for international relations, foreign relations uh, uh, participants and audience members, this is, this is an exercise in soft diplomacy at a massive scale uh, that the U.S., as a non-foreign relations person, as I just look at it out the outside, the U.S. is losing a, an extraordinary opportunity here 
uh, that and the Chinese and the Russians are are filling this gap. Whether uh, the vac Chinese vaccines are of the quality that we would like, you know, we won't know till we see the data. But I'm going to hazard a guess that there's a decent chance that they are pretty high quality, uh, high quality vaccines. They shortcut it in both cases. The process that is being followed in the US and Europe and Japan, and India and many other countries. So if we are worried in the US, and we'll get to this about uh, whether a vaccine that is developed in, in a short time frame is something that we as individuals should take. And I personally am not, but that's what we're gonna talk about next. Certainly I, I've talked to colleagues and, and journalists from countries that are anticipating uh, making available uh, Chinese and especially Russian vaccines. and they're deeply worried uh, about um, the confidence that the publics there should have in these vaccines because there the process has been super shortcutted and way, way less transparent. So we're gonna talk about um, trust in a, in a second, but I wanna give Reed the last word on, on this topic before we make that switch. In the interest of time, let me just say that Ruth nailed it. And, and I wanna just underscore uh, uh, just two key points. Number one, I think it is very important to understand the geopolitical issues here uh, and the dangers that are, uh, are there. Not only the dangers of the United States having, having ceded uh, a leadership role uh, in around the world, uh, which has its own implications, um, but, but I think also the, the, the sense that um, that by, by, co by combining political objectives with scientific interventions, you start now to really run into to, to a whole series of ethical minefields. Secondly, what is really key that she also mentioned, and it's where we're headed now, so I'll, I'll just touch it, and that is there is a real sense that as these um, vaccines that have not received the kind of testing certification that we would have expected here in the United States. There is the presumption by many parties that these folks who are poorer countries are being used as guinea pigs. Uh, and that this is a, a sort of a, a way in which uh, people will find out how well, well va vaccines work or their safety uh, in people who are dependent upon the largesse of these donor countries. That uh, sets up a whole set of, of, of anxieties in a world where uh, everyone is interconnected and there are no secrets uh, what's going on. What happens in Mali uh, is known 